Okay. Well, now this is going to have to be a discussion between all of us because if I just stand up here and talk, it's going to be boring. So anything you see that I don't cover, jump in. Ask questions because um, it's, it's mainly older transceivers. Well, it's not all, only older transceivers, but it's, it's mainly up through the, about the 90s, but there's some sense I've thrown in there. So anyway, before I hit the first slide, who in here can tell me what was most likely the first modern transceiver ever on the market? Who made it and what it was? KWS1. KWS1? Yes. That's a KWM1, you mean? That's right. And it was packed. I had one. It was packed. At least they came out with a uh, later model that uh, had a bigger box on it. But there's some very unusual things about this, as you can probably tell. Number one, the, uh, the VFO only tuned for 100 kcs. So for every 100 kcs, you needed a, a new crystal in the crystal box here. Of course, you could get two or three or four crystal boxes, however many you wanted. Um, now, at that time, we only had 10, 15, and 20 meters, so that's what it was advertised for, but it will cover 12 and 17. If you pick up one today, all you got to do is put the crystals in. Because, as you notice, the exciter tuning is continuous, and the finals will tune to it, of course. Uh, interesting thing about the, um, the Pi Network tuning, uh, most everything, in fact, I can't think of anything other than this that doesn't use variable capacitors for the tuning. This one used rotary inductors. The capacitors were fixed, they tuned the, the uh, coils, in effect. So there's two rot rotary inductors here, one's loading and one's uh, plate tuning. Henry used a similar deal in some of the early amplifiers. Yeah, but not in a transceiver. I don't know if any others that use rotary inductors right. and transceivers. And the, the, the advantage of that is that the dial is linear with a capacitor. You're right. You're right. It's compressed at one end and light at yeah. the other end. You're right. I never thought of that. Um, while it had a key input, I think, um, it wasn't very good on CW because you had to use a sideband filter. So it was not very selective, but hey, it worked. And uh, you're going to pay a big buck if you find them on the used market today. The were not real crowded back then either. No. Yeah, but you had the AM signals that were out there that were taking up space. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now the next model that came out was the KWM2. This is one of my favorite so-called antique transceivers. It's uh, not crowded inside. It's easy to work on. It does everything well, except CW. Uh, I think that the KWM2A had provisions for a CW filter, but I don't think the, uh, the straight KWM2 did. But uh, that's, a, that's a great choice. Pardon? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's it's a good choice for a used transceiver. You won't be ha unhappy with it. Is that your actual rig? No. I have one, but that's not mine. Okay. And I just, some parts are almost unattainable. Like the hairline, the red hairline on it, mine had a broken uh, disc, and the pinch drive wouldn't stay on it. So I put a query out, and the guy had one for $29. What's the final? 6146. What, what's the year of this? Uh, that's uh, came out about 58. When, when I was in Vietnam, 
That's how we talk to the states. Yep. And those yep. Exactly. Yep. Same I've time. always <laughs> dreamed about finding a warehouse full of <laughs> brand new packed uh, KWM2s yeah. that are surplus <laughs> sale for ten dollars a piece. They threw thousands of them in the ocean. Oh, I'm sure they did. But we went through uh, uh, gold, 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 gold waters, yeah. gold waters thing in he Phoenix. The, for the uh, foam patches, yeah. and he paid for the oh, yeah. long distance call. Yeah, he paid. That, <coughs> that was the rig that we used. Yeah, that was a nineteen. Huh, I hate myself here. Nineteen sixty-seven, sixty-eight. Yeah, I don't remember when the last one was built. Because then they it went, to the, well into the mid -70s. Yeah, it, it was okay. Because it came out then with the KWM 380, something like that, which I never operated. Never, I never even seen one personally. Okay. So does the KWM2, does it go down into the VHF, UHF, or only no, HF? No, just HF. Three, uh, 3 to 30 megahertz. Okay, the next one is Heathkit. Actually, this was the first sideband rig I ever had. Uh, and this is, this is mine but not the original. Um, it's only a single band. They made them in three bands, 80, 40, and 20 meters. Um, no CW. It uh, has a lot of operate output power. They'll do somewhere around 130 watts PEP. Um, you can force them to get on AM just by bringing the carrier up a little bit. In, in in the tune position, as I remember. I haven't tried it lately. Uh, the disadvantages is the dial is fairly fast tuning, so it's sometimes a little hard to rock it right on frequency. And they do drift just a little bit. Not as bad as some, but if you leave it on a couple, a couple or three hours, it'll settle down and won't drift more than 100 cycles an hour. Uh, it's fixed loading. You have no loading control, so the antenna needs to be close to one to one. Certainly not over 1.6 or 7 to one. And its big disadvantage is it uses TV sweep tubes, which are not built any longer, and they were never built in large quantities other than enough to cover the TV industry. So if you buy a pair of sweep tubes, they're going to probably be $30 a piece, and it takes two. But yet again, of all I've worked on and the two or three I've had, I never had a problem with final. So. But it's a good little rig. You can get them for as low as $35, even $25 sometimes on eBay, and at the most, $85. Usually goes around $50, $55. Okay, next is one of my favorites, the Heathkit SB101. I had the earlier version, the SB100, but I have this one now. This is mine, SB101. Um, with the variable loading, you don't have to worry about SWR within limits because that Pi network is basically a tuner. So uh, you just tune it, and it'll work in 5 or 6 to 1 SWR. You have an external VFO available. The finals are 6146Bs. Or they're easy to find. They're not particularly expensive, 12 to 18 dollars. Um, like I said, there was three versions. The SB100 had no CW filter. The 101 does have a CW filter, and the 102 was identical to the uh, 101, except it had a solid-state VFO instead of a tube type. And the the 100 and the 101s, the uh, VFO was made by TRW, and it was a, a sealed VFO. It worked beautifully. The 102, you built the VFO, and you aligned the VFO. And I've read that some people don't like them, that they buy a used TRW and replace it. But it's a, it's a workhorse. It's well worth the money that you have to pay for it. If, if you, I have 125 to 300, but I doubt that you ever see one except you in the box for $300. Uh, usually they go for, for 125 to 200. And sometimes even with the power supply. And sometimes with the power supply. 
and they're almost on there daily on eBay. It's almost always a, uh, one of the one of the three on there. And the later, I think it's coming up next. The later version of it. No, I don't. It's not that. Maybe I have it on there later. Later version of it was the HW100 and the 101, and it was kind of a cheapened SB. They left out a lot of things on it, a lot of metering. You couldn't meter the, as I remember, the grid was was eliminated, and so uh, maybe the high voltage. I think I think the only thing you could read on the the HW series was the relative output power for tuning and uh, the plate current. I think it had an SWR meter too, because I had one. I think it had a little cheap SWR. Did, did it have an SWR built in? Okay. But even the chassis seemed lighter weight. Yeah, uh, it yeah, it, it might have been. It used the same circuit boards. It just didn't put some of the parts in it. <laughs> Here's another perennial favorite. In fact, I might say this is probably one of the best transceivers ever built. Almost nothing goes wrong with them. Uh, and this is mine, by the way. Uh, I should have powered them up so the VF, uh, so the dial was showing. But it's 160 to 10 meters. The digital readout is to is to 100 kcs. These days we're used to reading them to a cycle. Uh, uh, and the dial is is very well calculated because each a calibrate because each one of these marks is a KC and as you'll see on the later version of it each one of the marks is 10 KC's which far, as far as I'm concerned you don't even need a dial if you go be that coarse but um, it's just a great rig it has just about everything just about everything you need it, uh, except, uh, what was it that doesn't have? Um, it has box. Uh, I've forgotten what it was. I said, uh, uh, oh, um, I don't know, a notch. It doesn't have a notch on it. I think the 830 did, right? Yeah. But the 830 had that poor, that poor yeah. dial on it. Yeah. So this is 1970s. It's the yeah. beginning of the Japanese. Japanese manufacturers yeah. coming into Yeah, I bought my first one in 77 and uh, kept it for, I don't know, 10 years, I guess. You could buy these for about 300 Oh, yeah. No, no more than 300 um, You can get them for 250 if you watch. You can get them for $100 if you're willing, willing to repair one. <coughs> but that's a great starter rig. Okay, the next one, the TS-830, the later version. Um, in some respects, it was a little bit easier to troubleshoot because the boards were horizontal, where in the A-20, the boards were mounted vertically. So the vertical mounting boards are hard to get a test probe in to read it, where the horizontal ones are a little bit easier. But that's... Neither here nor there. Uses the same tubes. It's, it's basically the same rig with just the added features to it. Um, Wasn't it pretty much all solid state except for the driver? except for the finals. The A20 was the A20 was also. Yeah, six BE6 and six pair sixty one forty six. No, a B, not a BE6. Well, six. A six CL7, six CL7. The usual driver tube. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a gr it's a great rig, well worth the money. You don't need to put out twelve hundred dollars for one of the new ones out today. Actually, if you if you if you work the uh, inflation calculator, this one cost about eighteen hundred dollars in today's money. Somewhere up in that neighborhood is about uh, almost 10 to 1. Did, did the 820 have the warp bands? No, the no, 20 did not have the warp band. And, uh, and this one does. So they each have some advantages and disadvantages. But um, they're really, uh, really nice radios and well worth the money. Any other questions? Or Jim, I'm impressed you have it on CW. 
this is not mine. <laughs> I, I, I stole that off the internet. I'm looking for one. I mean, I might as well fill in the slide. Okay, the next one is the TS850S, and this is mine. Um, a good overall rig. I have nothing bad to say about it. But the DDS chips on the early models were problematic. Yep, well, so far I have, the only problem I have with this one, and I haven't gotten into fixing it, is the 60 dB attenuator doesn't work. I think one of the resistors is open because when you flip it in, you lose all signals. You go to 12 dBs, everything is fine. So, it's a 600 so dB attenuator. yeah, a 6 dB attenuator is not very much on these crowded bands. You need at least a 10. Anyway, it does have the optional CW and SSB filters. It has variable passband tuning, which is very nice. And in fact, if you put all the filters in it, it really is a bandwidth adjustment because you can adjust the filter, the uh, pass band tuning on the far right. It's, it's two knobs, one low cut and one high cut, and you can just set the the bandwidth you want. And it had one of the best antennas, automatic tuners. Right? Yep, I mean that for for a mechanical tuner, it's fast. I mean, like zip, and it's done. But well worth the money. Um, I haven't priced one recently. Fourteen hundred on eBay right now. That's too much. That's too much. I I'm, I'm saying four. I'm saying four hundred to four fifty is a five hundred maybe. Um, some of the sometimes you just have to watch eBay for a few days and say, okay, well this was much too expensive. There's been one on eBay I've been watching for three weeks. The guy started. It wasn't one of these. The guy started at one hundred and fifty. Nobody bid. He dropped it to 130. Nobody bid. He relisted it at 130. Nobody's bid. I'm waiting for it to get down to about 100, and I'll bid on it. <laughs> but this is this is a good buy in a, in a pretty modern transceiver. Um, these were built in the 96, 90s. 96, yeah, something like that. And well, you, you have one, so you you know how good it is. It's a it's a great tra overall have, transceiver. I have a, a wide collection of articles like the yeah. zip and zip. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. And its little brother is the Kenwood is the Kenwood TS one thirty S. Um, the front owns one that's available to any member as a loan. Yeah. So but is that a, is that a one thirty or one twenty? Is it a one thirty? Why you donated it? Yeah. I think it's a 130. The, 130, yeah. Okay, the yeah. early ones were, were 120s and didn't have the warp <coughs> bands That's and right. didn't have the the selection of a, a wide or narrow filter for sideband, where this one does. Um, and this is mine also, by the way. Um, I inherited a lot of stuff. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great rig. It's small. Mostly people bought them for mobile use, so when you're buying a used one, you've got to watch to be sure. Hopefully it wasn't used in the mobile very much, or if it was, it was kept clean. Because I've seen some that I've used in the mobile that looked like they dumped coffee over them and everything else, <laughs> and they probably did. Uh, but well worth the money, $175, $200 is about the going price of them. Uh, 100 watts I put. Um, External VFO is optional. Uh, you have digital and analog readout. Once again, the digital readout is in 100 kcs. Um, it's just a, a good radio if you want a, a small radio. The box controls are, by the way, are up on the top. You can just barely see them in that picture. Okay, I just have to throw these in. Everybody back in the 70s knew about the Swan. The Swan and Heathkit were probably the two most popular radios because they were reasonably priced. But the Swan had several nicknames, mainly the Drifting Swan. So they did drift quite a bit. Um, 
Each each band on the VFO was adjust, was calibrated separately. Um, I think if I remember correctly, it had a nine megahertz IF filter, which is by flipping the uh, going to the other side, taking the VFO to the other side, picked up 20 or 75 meters, depending on which way it was switched. Uh, but that's not the big thing. The other thing, the, ba the bad thing is, once again, it uses sweep tubes in the final. And this one used two, I think. Um, not a bad radio, but uh, I wouldn't pay o I wouldn't pay over about 125 for one because it does require an extra power supply, which is also about a hundred dollars. And the later Swan, the 500C. Now this one, I think, used three of the sweep tubes in the final, so you're going to have over $100 to replace the tube, those three tubes in it. And by the way, it is a 100% tube, except for a few diodes. It has a very nice vernier on it. And uh, once again, it's one of the non-WARC bands. For the ones who don't know, WARC was World Administrative uh, Radio Conference that back in the 70s approved 12, 17, and 30 meters. So it's, it became known as the Wark Bands, those three. Uh, like I say, if you find one at a good price that's clean and not beat up, it's worth $100, $125. I, mean, I, I saw a 350 on eBay actually sell for like $79. Yeah. And all this shit. Okay, and I think it's very similar but less than right? Yeah, right. Not, not a lot. Yeah, the, this was rated at uh, 500 watts input. So about 150 to 200 watts output was what it gave, and it had three of the sweep tubes in the final, as in I those remember. those days, the sweep tubes were about four dollars. Oh yeah, still that's right. But now it's hard to find, <laughs> almost <laughs> impossible to find a new one, and even a used one will cost you thirty dollars. Mm -hmm. So that's one way, to, one reason to stay away from it. Now we get into what is my <clears throat> favorite brand is Tentac. Unfortunately, they're no longer in business, per se. They're not building any equipment. They're still building, but not any ham equipment. They hope to get it back in, in uh, production. Well, every time I get an email, it's the end of the year. <laughs> That's been going on for three years now. <laughs> right. Um, anyway. This is one of, not their earliest, but one of their earliest, the, the, uh, one of the Omni D's. Um, it's an excellent radio, 100 watts output. Uh, you can put uh, CW and sideband filters optional, other than the one that it comes with. It does have the work bands, 10 to, 10 to 160 coverage. Um, price. Is on the high end there. The price will be 250 and up usually. Occasionally you can find one cheaper, but it it has the best CW. If you operate in CW, it has one of the best CW circuits of anything. It's it's very quick, very smooth. You can actually hear between hear the signals between your dashes. <laughs> so if somebody breaks you, you can hear them while you're transmitting. For the non-CW operators, you ought to explain that. Because there are probably some people that don't understand the difference between break-in and semi-break-in. Okay. Semi-break-in means that you put it in transmit, the relay is closed, you hear nothing out of the receiver anymore, and then you send the CW. Uh, break-in is it's all automatic. <coughs> when you send a dash, the receiver mutes. When you quit the dash, the receiver comes back on. So it's, you can hear, you can't really hear between the dots, but you can hear between the dashes. And if somebody uh, breaks you or interferes, throws a carrier on the frequency, you can hear it while you're transmitting. The later version, which is the preferred version, is the Omni C. Um, it has all the work band. It's a it's a different, somewhat different design. 
Uh, some of the boards are different. But it has the wart bands. It has, <clears throat> it has the uh, crystal filters on, on the right. You have crystal filters. You also have an audio filter. Uh, you have notch. Uh, I need to explain one thing about uh, Tentec, though. They have a control called ALC. <coughs> Well, most people think of ALC as when, a, when you're overdriving your linear or your final amplifiers, it starts cutting back on the gain so you don't hit that. Well, Tentec doesn't do it that way. They call it ALC, but it really should be called power control because you set a power level you want, 50 watts, 80 watts, 100 watts, and it won't go over that. No matter how hard you scream, or loud you scream into the microphone, it will not go over what you set it for. So a lot of people buy a linear, Meritron or whatever, and they say, there's no ALC connection on the back of the uh, transceiver. How do I connect up the ALC? Well, you don't need an ALC with it, because you find out what the maximum power it requires to transmit, and you set that power with the control and not worry about it. I haven't run ALC for 40 years. And in most, and in, uh, I'm looking at it on the scope, on the ones I have, in virtually every case, no matter how much you drive, with, drive it with, it will not flat top. No, I, I can't really explain that. But my linear takes about 75 to 80 watts for full power output. I can put 100 watts into it, and I don't see any difference on the scope. Can't explain it. This one also has what some of the other rigs don't have that I like, is all the box adjustments are on the front panel. I have some that the box adjustments are on the back panel. And you always want to readjust the box during a, a uh, contest or something, and to get up and go around to the back and tweak it a little bit is a pain. Another one, this is mine, uh, the Corsair 2. Excellent radio. In fact, it's probably the best radio that they built before going to the SDRs, software defined radios. It has a, a true VFO in it instead of a synthesizer. Um, it's very stable, not as stable as a synthesizer, but after a half an hour or so warm up, it probably won't move more than 50 cycles an hour. Um, it has, it'll take, uh, let's see, it'll take four filters, sideband or CW, whichever ones you want. Uh, once again, let me get over here. You have your, 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 um, where is it? the power control, G, ALC. Oh, here it is. The ALC control is there uh, to set whatever power level you want out. And I very seldom had any problems with them. I've owned, what have I owned? I've owned two now, I guess. I sold my earlier one. I also had a Corsair one for about a month before somebody talked me out of it. But I never operated that much. And it, the Corsair one, had a different color front panel on it, and I forgot it had a couple other things different, but still a worthwhile rig. And you can pick this up for $300, <clears throat> maybe less if you watch eBay or some of the other swap sheets. Okay, now we're going into Dennis's radio. The Argosy 2. An excellent little QRP, well, not quite QRP radio, 50 watts output, all you need, or even 75 meters, 20 for 75. Uh, you can put an optional CW filter in it. It has a notch filter. It does not cover the warp bands. It has receiver incremental tuning, the beautiful Tentec QSK, and it's an excellent low power, lower power rig, I won't call it low power, lower power rig, and you can pick them up for around, around $200. You uh, just want a field day right now? Yep. Yeah. The picture that this has that the others don't have is a switch in the back 
You can drop yeah. it to five watts. You can drop it to five watts. You can run it off of AA batteries. Yeah. I mean, you know, or you have the option to flip the switch and then run it off. The current drain is going to be, of course, significant. Yeah. But That's uh, right. It's, it's a you can drop the output by 10 dBs. Yeah. It's still like a brick. And, uh, it just works great. It just works great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the 10 tech delta. And I can tell you they came out in 1979 because I bought a new one, serial number six. I wish I, I wish I still had it. I sold it. Uh, I bought it at Dayton in 1979. And in fact, it was one of the engineering models or one of the engineering prototypes. The first 10 were used by the engineers to check it out and be sure they'd done everything right. Uh, great rig, hard to find one these days in decent condition because the front panel was all plastic. A lot of people mishandled them, scratched them, dropped them and, and cracked them. But if you can find, a, uh, find one, they're well worth the um, $150, but it doesn't have all the features that the Corsair II does for about the same price. But I ran one for 15 years as the main rig. 15, no, 10, I guess. I'm not that old. Okay, SDR. You, I, I don't care what anybody says, it's hard to beat the Tentec Jupiter. Um, it's not quite the best rig they've ever built, but for all practical purposes, most of us will never know the difference. Um, it uh, does not require any optional filters. All the filters are, uh, are software filters, and it works, that works great. Uh, their DSP from 150 hertz to 8 kilohertz, and in fact, this this is mine, by the way. Um, I have I have uh, what do I have now? I have three of them now. One one is a QRP one because I can't figure out what the heck has happened to the power amplifier, so I just plug the driver right into the low pass filter board and it puts out a watt and a half. And I've checked in the 75 meter nets with it. Uh, the, other, the other one I have, which I think I have on here later, maybe not, I don't know, is the latest version, which has the CW reader and the keyboard uh, CW. Even though the reader, for, as far as I'm concerned, you can just take it and throw it somewhere. Because it's very poor unless the CW is perfect and there's not any QRM. But anyway, on this one, you have a built-in CW tier, a passband tuning, a noise blanker, a DSP noise reduction, RIT and XIT, transmitter incremental tuning. Uh, you have all modes, sideband CW, AM and FM. All controls are, are optical. None of them are, are old-fashioned pots. They're all encoders. Uh, it has a RS-232 serial port on the back, two built-in VFOs, uh, squelch. The VFO steps can be from 1 hertz steps to uh, 100 kilohertz steps. There's two versions known as the green screen and the blue screen. The blue, the blue screen is the newest one. Um, the, uh, the green screen came out about 90, I guess, something like that. Is there any uh, improvements besides the color of the screen? Not really. None that I've been able to determine. Uh, the diff there's a difference in color of the panel. The panel on the green screen is gray. The panel on the uh, blue screen is black. And uh, a lot of people didn't like going to black ones, but everybody else did. Um, Jim, wasn't that the Pegasus put in a box with knobs? Did basically, it was some upgrade. Yeah. No, it was basically the Pegasus, yeah, the first SDR they had. But you can't go wrong with one. Are these really SDRs or just digital-based? No, they're SDR. It has an SDR chip in it. Okay. It's not, it might not be considered full SDR like Bob's Flex or something like that, but it's SDR. Um, then you go to the Omni 6. 
Mike McPherson is familiar with the Omni 6. It is a, uh, an, uh, another partial SDR transceiver. Very, very good uh, transceiver. I've never owned one, so I can't say too much about the operation, but it has all the features you need. Um, they tend to be going for between three and 400 on an average right now. Uh, there were several versions. There was the Omni 6, and then there was the Omni 6, there was the Omni 6 Plus. And then there was a ver uh, was updates for the Omni 6 that supposedly gave you almost everything that the Omni 6 Plus had. But uh, then I've forgotten all what was what was different now. But good radio. Yeah, you never talked about the power gun. No, I didn't. This is transceivers. <laughs> yeah, okay. the Paragon was it was a general coverage transceiver, uh, <coughs> much in the, uh, let me think, much like the uh, Omni 6. Um, it was sort of an Omni 6 on steroids. There's a, has been a little bit of problem on the, um, on one of the boards, on the SDR board, with bad <coughs> solder joints. A lot of people have intermittent, they won't stay locked in anything, and the solution is to go in, pull the board, and resolder all the connections, and 90% of the time that fixes it. But then we come to the Omni 7, and this is mine, by the way. I own two of these. I don't know why, but I do. Uh, and I actually, the reason for it, it was too, the price was too good to pass up. I think I paid about $300 for this one. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, this is the one I use every day. You talk to me on 20 meter net, that's what I'm using usually. But it's a, it's a great rig, it's a little bit better than all the others, but not a whole lot. But I, pref <clears throat> I prefer it over a few of the others because you have a separate button for every function. Some of them you push the button in and hold it for one function, tap it for another, hold it for five seconds for a third. I don't like that. I have to have the instruction book in front of me to tell how to do everything. But this has just this has everything in it that uh, you need. Uh, I'm seeing these go for generally in the seven to eight hundred dollar neighborhood. Um, I think it was 27, 2800, yeah. And um, th these were the last, almost the last, well, this was in production when, they when the company was sold. Um, there are several others that were in production too. But um, this does not have the, the receiver specs that some of the later ones had the, are, well, back up here, one of the earlier ones had and one of the later ones had, but it's so good, I have never had a problem with it. I have never run up against the limitation of the third order intermod, which is about 79 dBs, as I remember. You had the rubbish filters in yours? Yeah, all of them. All of them. All of them. Both of them. Both of, them, both of mine have the roofing filter. Unfortunately, this is the only one that doesn't have the antenna, that does, this is the one that has the antenna tuner, the other one doesn't. And I don't need it where I have it set up because I have the, the LDG on the amplifier. So I keep the, I'll just switch them. But, but this is, as far as I'm concerned, this is, this is the top pick performance wise that you'll find in the 10 tech line for the price. You can go on and we'll come up to the 10 tech Argonite 5, which is 20 watts output. Once again, it has about everything you ever need in the way of filters, 35 DP, uh, DSP filters as a general coverage receiver. <clears throat> I might add the Omni 7 also has general coverage receiver. 
It has all the modes, it's sideband CWA, MFM, and AF, AFSK. Um, two VFOs, 100 memories. I can't, re I can't store enough in memory. I think I use 10 maybe at the most. And that's with w, all the WWV frequencies and things like that. A noise blanker, a great little rig at a uh, relatively low price, 250 to 300 is about the most you'll have to pay for one. Um, this is not mine, but I had one and sold it. I'm kind of sorry I did now. Then we go on to the, late, the, the latest one they, ha they made. This was in production when they closed the, uh, closed the or sold the business, and th this is mine also. And the Eagle had the top-notch receiver specs because it had the uh, basically it had the same receiver uh, that the um, Orion had, and the Orion was one of the top ones. Not anymore. Bob Fleck beats it on third order in my. But once again, a great rig, 100 watts output, 127 DSP filters, and it also has three Collins mechanical filters in it. Uh, you can use either 300 or 500 for CW. I recommend the 500. And uh, a 1.8 KC, uh, 2.2 KC, and, and it has a built-in 2.4 KC for sideband. Excellent radio. So you recommend this even over an Omni 7? I prefer the Omni 7 for one reason. This is a better receiver. I've never noticed the difference between them, but this is technically the better receiver. The reason I like the Omni 7 better is I don't like two and three options on a button. Whereas the Omni 7, I can just go to it, hit the button, and I'm there. This way I have to, oh, do I have to hold it? Oh, no, I have to hit the function button down there on the bottom left and then select the second choice. That's the only reason I, I don't like this versus the Omni 7. Ergonomic. But with the case size, they couldn't do anything else. They didn't have room for, what, 10 more buttons. <coughs> Okay, the last one they built, uh, the last one of the last three, uh, the Argonaut 6, this is mine also. Uh, once again, you have those selections on the, on the buttons, but at least you don't have to push the button and hold it. You notice you have a toggle switch down there next to the dial that says T, M, and S. You notice the rows up there. T top, M middle, B bottom. So if you want to do RIT, for example, you flip that switch to B and hit the button that's labeled BAN, and you get RIT. Easier than having to hold a button in. It's 10 watts output, plenty of power. Uh, by the way, this does not mean CW. I'm not sure what it should be labeled, but it has nothing to do with CW. <laughs> it's like, I don't know, if it had another C, it'd be counterclockwise, but, <laughs> but uh, it gives you another function, and I've forgotten what the function is now. Once again, it's one of these, I need the instruction book to do some of the things with it. it but it's a good rig, low power rig, if you want something to do um, summits on the air or something like that. This is as good as any. Not quite as small as the Yezu FT817, but it, it's not bad. Okay. What's next? Oh, the holy grail of Tentec, the Orion 2. There are just too many features to talk about. If you can think of it, I think it has it in, in it. Yeah, it has uh, dual receivers in it, even though most of them came, the second receiver 
was basically the receiver out of the Jupiter. It did not meet, the second receiver did not meet the specs of the first receiver. But later on, just about the time, maybe a year before they sold the company, they came out with a replacement board for that second receiver to give you an identical receiver. And as I remember, the board was about $400 in. Um, but well worth the money. I've been watching one on, um, on eBay. Uh, so far, I haven't bid on it, but uh, it was sitting there at 1400 and it had been sitting there for four or five days, and it'll probably go for about that. So 1800 might be a little bit high if you watch eBay, but I've se and I've seen them advertised for 2500 but I've never seen any bids on them. So. But this one cost about $3,500 new. Back in uh, let's see, oh six, I think. I think I think two thousand six, two thousand seven, they were building them. The re one of the reasons they stopped building them was Motorola uh, discontinued the microprocessor they were using, and they couldn't get microprocessors for it, and they didn't want to spend the money to redesign the circuit board for a different microprocessor, so they just stop production of it. Okay. I'll let you read that for a moment. You walked out the TS-520. Yeah, I couldn't put everything in here. No. We'd be here until 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> okay, this is the next best, the next best of the different make is the Elecraft K3S. Do you have, a, do you have one? No. <laughs> this one has not been released yet. Uh, the nearest model, the nearest current model costs $7,500. This one will likely be higher. Anybody guess which one it is? What? Any guesses? What make? Elecraft. Shipping those now. They are shipping. They are shipping. They must have just started recently because when well, I did this about two weeks ago, they flat. said they weren't shipping yet. Yeah, I would see it. I saw something the yeah. past two days. Okay. People said they were starting. Yeah. To they were. They were waiting for FCC uh, type acceptance. I and think. If I recall that the list price of this <coughs> is somewhere just under four, and they have just, a trading program. Just under four. It's it's cheaper than the seventy than the uh, sixty six hundred because the sixty six hundred is uh, seventy five hundred according to flex price sheet. That's why I said this one's probably going to be higher. But if it's lower, that's better yet because it has just about everything you need right on the front panel. Sixty six hundred and fifty four hundred is is kind of like the sixty three hundred. Yeah. Oh. But yeah. you can operate it without being tethered to a computer. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's the advantage of the, of the, of the new 6400. Yeah. The, Is that direct sampling technology? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Direct conversion receiver. Direct sampling. Direct sampling. Yeah. But basically a direct conversion receiver, but more, much more sophisticated. Yeah. In other words, it's not a super heterodyne. Have you used, has anyone used one? No. Bob is the okay. closest to it. But, you like um, 7300, it's a little around $1,000, 1200 yeah, yeah. and it's got that newest. Yeah, and the 7410? 7610. 7610. I didn't include those because I don't know that much about ICON and ICOM, and um, I just didn't want to put too many slides I, I in. I do maybe a civil lecture in about a year with some letters from you on ICOM. Yeah. The rumor is that Yezu is going to come up with the best year. I wouldn't doubt that. Jim, uh, great presentation uh, for a rookie like me not to think about. But I noticed that you featured some Kenwood uh, 800 series. Mm -hmm. I happen to have uh, acquired recently a 530. Is okay. there something uh, about this radio that I need to be uh, aware of? Because I didn't see it listed as one of those there. No, not, re not really. The, the 530. 
was a different series, obviously, and it was. Was that what it was? Okay. No. no it, the 520 did not have the mark bands. The 530 did, and it went to a digital display, of course, they would be opposed. Okay. And I might even have a service manual for them. They're, they're yep. very good radios. They're good, they're good radios. And uh, the, I think one of the differences was, I'm, uh, you're taxing my memory now, the 830, I think, had triple, has triple yeah, conversion. The, the, five, the 530 has dual conversion. Right. It, 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 it's a little different. Natural. It's a, a little different uh, mixing scheme that they have. But it still works great. It's, it's nothing wrong with it. They have uh, the, at least the 830 has great audio. And I will recommend anybody that gets any of these transceivers, put an external speaker on it. It'll sound a lot better than that little three inch or two inch or even one inch speaker they put in some of them. Yeah. But, you know, a, a nice um, uh, Altec or something like that, 10 inch Wolfer on it, sound great. But the 500 series under there had like, you know, Mid-level, the 800 was like the more premium level. Yeah, right. That's what it is. The, the, the 500 series was a mid-level. Mid in fact, the 520, I think, was the first one Kenwood introduced yeah, uh, yeah. in a transceiver. They had the Even Kenwood the, twins, the, receiver the, and transmitter, but I think... I think the 520 came out after the 820. So no, it didn't. It, no, it didn't. I had a 520 I bought in 76, and it was competing with the Yaesu FD-101, which had sweet tooth. Yeah, right. I much prefer 6146s. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah. Any other questions about any? Oh yeah, the 520 is a great rig. We, I have a couple of guys on the Virginia phone net that still check in using the 520 occasionally. And they sound good. Morning, and I jointly worked on one but in the spring we had working in 20 minutes. Right? They're easy to work on. Oh, yeah, they're very easy. I've, I've, I've only worked on one, and it was kind of an easy, easy one to diagnose. The guy said, it doesn't seem to work on 40 meters. I don't hear anything. No, the crystal was bad. Ours was even easier. There's a little slide switch on the back for neutralization. Oh, and it was in. It was in. Was the wrong right. You cut the finals <laughs> off, right. If you were a brand new hand, what would you buy? If I was going to buy one of, the, one of these, it depends on how much money I had to spend. <laughs> if, I, if I didn't have a whole lot of money, I would try to get the Corsair II or the Kenwood TSA 20. Or even a Jupiter. Or, or Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is going to be just a little bit more, but not more than $100 more, probably less than that. Um, if I had the money, I would go with the uh, Omni 7. And once again, you remember that almost all of these are no longer in production, so you've got to buy a used one. But even if you want something like an Icon, I'm an Icon person, 750. Yeah, that's what I always in the past disliked about most of the company. Kenwood was the same way. After a certain number of years, eight or ten, they would not service them anymore. Tentec would service anything they ever built except one item, uh, including their earliest try at a transceiver. They would still service it before the company was sold. Uh, and I think they might still be doing that because the company is still, the new company is still uh, repairing them. Uh, <clears throat> Where's the 2010 to 2000 business model? Uh, Dudden, I didn't get to that. I, I couldn't get so many, but so many slides in it, Joe. <laughs> 2000 is an extremely complicated rig for the beginner. Right, it has a lot of buttons on it. No, I, I think for a beginner, the Corsair II, the uh, Kenwood 820S, or, uh, or an 830S, either one, uh, 850 even, if you can find it at the right price. They're all great rigs, and uh, you, won't be, you won't have to 
replace one in a year or two to feel like you need an upgrade. We got, we got one last question in the okay. back here. Well, it'll only be about 10 years to my allowance plays off the <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's see. You, you uh, could get uh, one of the Heath kits, the SB-101, even the SB-100, <coughs> for under $200. Now, it does require an, ex an external power supply. That's probably another $60. But still, for well under $300, you could, you could get an SB-101. Um, you can even go with the um, Argosy 2. That's 50 watts. Oh, you really need most of the time. You're not going to break a DX pile up with it very easily, even though you can do it. I've heard it done before. King's very good. Hmm? The break -in's very good. Yeah, it's an, it's an excellent CW radio. Excellent sideband, too, for that matter. I've, that I've gotten into my... Now, 75 meters is generally considered that you need a lot of power to run your net and all that. I have checked in to my net with, a, with less than 500 milliwatts. And the only thing they say, Jim, you're a little bit weaker than usual tonight. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome.